So for this, we would like to begin um, in the nature of echo architecture for the architecture students. This is a 12th century excavation site that I was at and working at for a brief time of Anagama kilns. These Anagama kilns you're seeing are going up hillsides. They were then, um, a number of them were designed specifically for the shape of the pots. This is not going to like going to like a used car sales and picking out a car to drive. This was actually these people in the 12th century understood the movement of flames. So you can see in the center, there are these airplane fins that are holding up the, used to hold up the roof of the kiln. They were able to massage and direct flame around the pieces for vitrification because most of these people were farmers and they had to have vitrification because it was the first time they're going past 2,300 degrees Fahrenheit, a silicate system, and then natural glazing. All that glaze is coming from the wood ashes melting on the surface. So that particular part, you can see that they shared outer walls and then they had different kinds of uh, firing flue areas. So if they were making whales jars or any kind of jar, then they had a shorter arch, a shorter end. So they could massage that flame to 2,300 years. This is the first place that they invented the chimney, back pressure chambers. So in the 12th century, they were already doing vitrification on a really great scale. The other aspect is as, as a student and a, an apprentice in Japan, the uh, pottery family had been working for 13 generations. Now they're in their 15th generation. They were brought over in slavery in 1593. So many of these pottery families were forcibly removed from their country of origin and brought to the Kyushu archipelago to make the high temperature silicate system, especially the tea ceremony for the warring class of daimyo warlords. So these families, the from Sariyama, the, um, the Onda pottery uh, families, it was the first time to be introduced for me to see multiple generations of family working, husband and wife working on glazing, then uh, the grandparents working on making other types of work. And then you realize that in this crag of a mountainside in, in Saga Can, these families were using water stampers that were hand out kind of like dugout canoes and the water was pouring out and that was pounding their iron clay. Everything had an integral rhythm and pattern in nature so that in the summertime when there was less rain, they could do the gardening. In the fall, they, and, and this, is, this was in the 1970s, before most of you were born, but the, um, the one thing that was evident was that you see all this slash wood that's up against their wood kiln. That was being carried down on the backs of women outside the mountainside, and you see, women coming down the mountainsides with these bamboo ba uh, baskets, uh, hauling the slash wood down. That's why they went from multi-chamber kilns because one energy became the next family's energy. So there were seven families that ran this seven chamber kiln. There was another five chamber kiln for the families that, because the, they had food to prepare. They're not gonna walk up that mountain one more time to get another stack of wood. They don't have to. So when this chamber, first chamber reaches 2000 degrees, the subsequent chamber is already at 1800 degrees from the waste heat. They could find thousands of pieces of high silicate system at a fraction of what we use in our gas kilns and electric kilns today. This is the um, entrance to the Nagazatos. This is the 15th generation pottery family that is making pots. And this is the entrance into their gallery area, which is made to look like a Kura a storage, a spiritual storage space with gardens and then a small flotilla of carp fish that are escorting them across there uh, with a pine tree in the boat across the pond. And then when the kilns are unloaded, the apprentices will be carrying the pots down in baskets down to the actual gallery site. This was the late uh, 12th century national treasure Nagazato uh, Muan and his son Nagazato the 13th, who is also since passed. And the um, one thing about it to understand is that it looks like a, just an old man uh, unloading a kiln. But if you can imagine that this man went through from in the 12th, their 12th generation, they never made a pot in their life. He was making Taoist immortal sculptures, Shinto sculptures, Buddhist sculptures. So the last six generations of the Nagazatos were sculptors. They had no relationship with pot making at all because the whole society had changed to a Confucian society. 
So you can imagine that in the 1920s when starvation started to come to these communities because there was the depression, and then you had the Japanese fascists then invading Manchuria and starting and bringing it onto World War II. This poor man in the civil defense had to sit at the potter's wheel and make grenades because the military came to him and said, you're gonna make grenades because we're all out of all materials for the invasion of the Americans. So here's said that, but they didn't have enough money to buy firewood. So here when the Americans, the war ends and they come uh, to the studios in Arita and Karatsu, there's all these throwing uh, grenades sitting in their, <laughs> in their studios. So they pile them all up, dig a big trench, push the bulldozer, push us in, they blow them up. And he had five children at that time, eight children. What do you do? You go and dig out the pottery shards from five generations, six generations prior to that and being re-inspired by the pottery shard. I'm going to make things that my family originally made when they were brought over in slavery to make tea wares. So he then, and, and so some of these things we take as being normal. Here was a coil and paddle jar. This would be a simple storage jar. He elevated that to an art form. Whereas in those time periods, that was radical behavior. Now we think of it as being normal because you see vases like that all the time. Prats was also known for its very simple, quickly painted, uh, where this is a very famous Karatsu jar. So the clay and the materials are the identity of the community. You can walk into any museum and say, oh, okay, that's from here, that's from there, that's from there. Your indigenous system is your identity. Your natural materials are your identity. And so you can go to Hagi, Bizen, Ichizen, any kind of community, Shigaraki, Mashiko, and you look at the clay and say, oh, that's from that particular community. Then as an apprentice, you take care of the teacher. The teacher is, the th is throwing. So this is the Nagazato, the, the third son um, that I stayed with. And so this is the central heart, the Idori. And then in the summertime, the, the Idori was used for then everyday kind of cold cooking. So you have uh, some uh, really wonderful so uh, ice soba noodles that you're having at lunchtime. So this integral relationship between family and food and design was absolutely critical to a point where that when I was a young apprentice, Takashi comes up to me and he gets on the potter's wheel and he makes a form like that. And he says, make a thousand of these. I said, okay. All right, so I'm throwing them, learning how to do the forms and then give me. And finally, I just stop and I say, in my very poor Japanese, what the hell am I making? Because if we put soup in here, it's going to come out the side. If we, um, you're not going to use it for sna snacks. What, what am I making? I have no idea what I'm making. He gets up from his wheel and walks out the room and leaves for about a half an hour. I say, oh, great. Lost in translation again. He walks back in and he's holding a branch. And he hands me the branch. He says, you're making these. I said, and then I, he says, look closely. These are, and then these were, there was a seed pod that opened up. And this was the shape of the seed pod called a warizancho. And sancho is a special spiced pepper that was considered the Buddhist healing spices that were brought from China to Japan, seven sacred spices for food. And so this is a seed pod dish. So how am I, you know, so then it's used in putting wonderful sashimi and uh, dishes with lacquer in a triangle. So in kaiseki yori, the food that you take into your body is also a spiritual form. For those people who have not seen a Zen painting of the universe, it's a triangle circle in a square. Okay, that means universe. So when you're having dinner in a kaiseki yori, you're having a triangle of food. You never have more than three dishes forming the triangle. And then you're on a circle of bone on a square table. So I am taking in the universe into my soul, into my nourishment, into my heart. That's the nature of the making. So 
all of a sudden I realize I am not making just objects. I'm making a relationship with first the environment and the natural materials that we're digging locally. <coughs> this is um, the home of Koyama Fujio. He was director of the Tokyo National Museum and uh, director of the Itamitsu Museum in Tokyo. And he, after World War II, started, the, he was the uh, head of the Cultural Ministry Board, which was the cabinet position. And he's the one who started the National Treasures of Japan, realizing that industrialism was going to destroy the identity of the Japanese people if we did not look at the artists that are in our communities as treasures, living human beings as treasures, not objects as treasures that you see in the museum, but the human being and what they can pass on to its community generationally. So this uh, Koyama Fujio invented on Tanagashima Island, a new style of firing that my teacher was part of. And in that firing, he, um, he used a Korean tunnel kiln, the Tepo Gama, we call um, it, with 12th century style. And he was doing this backfiring. So this is the kiln and the kiln shed area that was next to the studio. And then we were firing. He had passed away the day I came to Japan, to the studio, he had died. And so we were firing the last works of this man's life. And so I had never experienced a wood firing before. And so for nine days, we're stoking wood right in among the pottery. And I'm, and I'm thinking, oh, it's gonna be beautiful glaze wear, because I have no idea what, what, what's going on. And then we start unloading this kiln and then all the pots are covered in ashes. And I'm going, what are these people so excited about? I said, you know, I look at all these pots that have no glaze on them. They're all different. They just don't look like anything. And then you start washing them up and you're realizing these things are the natural earth speaking in a silicate world, the colors that we as human beings are attracted to, are attached to. So you can see that the natural colors and flame patterns are part of that process. So that is what you're seeing down here. Some of these are Tanagashima pieces from that style of firing from the oven Minnesota. So then they're building my teacher's home and, and studio. And here you can see the traditional temple carpenters, the Miyadike. And they were then building my teacher's house. And they were so exact in all their work, there was not one power tool in the whole site. They came with a little box of tools and they built all of this beautiful structure, male joint going into a female joint. Oh, I lost, okay, good, there we go. And um, here you can see this kind of beam goes into this. This is a complex form that you can then pound an oak stave into or oak peg into. It expands the whole joint and this can handle earth earthquakes. So the goal of these traditional temple carpenters is this building has to stand for 150 years. And then you can take the pegs out and the, and the posts and stuff and recycle and reuse the beaming, which was what my uh, teacher's studio was made from a 200 year old post and beams that were taken out of an old warehouse building and then rebuilt into a studio. All they were just were cut off in the ends and rejointed and reused. So this is it, they, they knew how they, cause Kyushu still has earthquakes. So they know how to deal with hurricanes, earthquakes, and they, they think about this as a 200 year building. So this is a Hashida, the main spiritual pole. And this bu building is then pulled together and, and with all the joints and pinned together. So this is what they call the spirit of the house. This particular post has 12 complex joints in it that are then holding the main frame of the structure together. This building was assembled in 10 days, okay? It was all pre-cut, ready to go. This building was assembled in 10 days. They loved the, the, the white guy because he was bigger than them. So I could hold up the beam. They wouldn't let me touch his tools, but I, was, I could do that, you know? So then I, there was a moment when this was all going on that I had realized I'd been tricked that all my education here in America was abstract and I could not make 
anything in the world work. And that I had no way of making connections to the persimmon flower and the 12th century Muchi painting of the six persimmons, the spiritual center of Daitokuji's Zen Buddhism. That I had to go back and say, why am I making what I'm making? How am I going to then take the abstract of where I grew up in Benedictine monastery at their table. This is designed by Marcel Breuer, um, another hero of mine, to the table at the hearth in the pottery studio. How do we bring the community around here within its indigenous and natural systems into this abstract system here? How are we gonna change that? So when I came home, that's where I was born. I was born out in the prairies in North Dakota. And so I started talking to my relatives because I was the black sheep in the family um, because many of the uh, North Dakota National Guard died in the Bataan Death March during World War II. And so the attitude towards the Japanese was rather severe. So they called my mother and father up and told them that their son was a traitor, that he was gonna be going and studying with the Japanese. So that wasn't a very hospitable environment. And then I had dear friends in, within the Native American community, the Ogallala Sioux tribes. And I asked them about how I was gonna work with my own environment here in, in the prairies. And, the, and um, the idea of the sacred buffalo and the Christian cross ever coming together is never gonna happen. It's never gonna happen. And the reason why, it's stuff like this, okay? This is a distant photograph, same photograph right here. Here's the Secretary of the Interior in the 1950s signing over 400,000 acres of land to make the Garrison Diversion Dam, okay? All of these guys that have our, with their hands in their face weeping, that are staring away, not looking at the paper being signed, looking away here. Those are all the Native American elders that were brought from North Dakota that were giving this land and losing their burial sites forever of all of their communities to be flooded for making electricity. No compensation. So I have to go back as to why we keep doing this. Why do we keep doing this to our indigenous cultures? Well, if we look at this, here's the architect's plan for a palace in, in, um, in, um, in Europe. And you see the beautiful porcelain um, forms that were coming from Japan from the Koimari porcelains. And Augustus is strong. I hope I got a photograph of him here. I might have just pressed this thing too far. Yeah, here he is. Okay, this is Augustus the Strong, 1643. Porcelains show up from the other side of the planet. The only people who can afford them are the wealthy. So they start eating off these high silicate systems fired above 2,300 degrees Fahrenheit. Augustus the Strong puts up a proclamation if you have lots of porcelain around, you're not going to die because they started feeling better because the ceramics that was being used at that time was lead glazed earthenware that came out of Turkey, Syria, Greco-Roman empire into Europe. Well, you know that what lead in glazes do to human beings, but then you also have someone that earthenware never dries out in a climate that isn't a desert climate. So Fuller talks about the optimum condition with the optimum uh, materials. This is the optimum condition for where there's a need of a silicate system. So then he does call in the architects and says, build me porcelain rooms because the doctors say they'll put a chair in the room and it radiates good health and they're not going to die. They're all dying, of course. No one's getting off the planet alive. And so this is, the this is what the architects had to do. This is what you would have had to do if you're in school at that time. 
And you can see how the Republican Party came in at early date, never on time for anything. You know, so that um, this is how they took those porcelains and made them even more rarefied with gold and silver and those types of um, accoutrements. What did it do to the other side of the planet? So this is the 1918 November issue of the National Geographic. And it was 1914 that the explorers went up the river and it was interrupted by World War I in the publication. This is the famous imperial household porcelain makers of Chindachan in China. These are the kilns. These are the glazers in 1914, 110 years ago, 100 years ago. The explorers in the written saying, the uh, said, um, pity the poor Chinese. All, they cut all the trees down. There wasn't a tree within 150 square miles. Their soil had turned to a desert. They could grow no food. So they had run out of materials. So this man here who's blowing the glaze on the pots, he got paid the most because he only lives to the age of 32 because he gets silicosis in his lungs and his lungs fill up with clay dust. E.F. Schumacher talks about the fact that when you're making things that you don't use and shipping it someplace else, you not only abuse your workers, you abuse your materials and you abuse your environment. So these teapots were not ever used by the Chinese. They were drinking out of tea bowls with small lids and the leaves would expand. It was, tea was a healing part of their diet. It was medicine. And this was going to Europe where it wasn't. They'd run out of wood. So you can see in the great distance, there's not a single tree completely cut down. Have to bring the wood from great distance down by boat. They ran out of clay. All the clay is gone. So we have to get the porcelain clay from uh, another site, greater distance, all brought down. But then look at that hillside there. That hillside right there goes three lengths of a football field, 60 feet high of broken shards. So that if it, the pottery didn't meet the European standard for exactness, they had to break it. These, these, I'm going to go back because you have to understand these kilns, these kilns were putting pottery in seven times. So if you, if you have Thanksgiving with your grandma at her place and she pulls out the fine china, it's got all the beautiful paintings and all the colors. That's been in a kiln seven times sometimes because there's different temperatures for the different things to melt. At the bottom of these shard piles, what they call guan ware. This was a beautiful time period in the Sung Dynasty where that they loved this work so much and it was used so much that it, the crackle and the glazes changed the color. It was really considered the finest type of ceramics. One energy unit. They threw the bowl on the potter's wheel, dipped it in a glaze and fired it. One energy unit. The 2,300 degrees Fahrenheit. So we go to Kohler Corporation over in Wisconsin, just north of you. Went for a tour, and the person who's giving us a tour shows us, you know, these beautiful sinks that they're making. And she says, Oh, by the way, this is our special new sink. We get a Pentium chip to make a random crackle pattern to look like the Chinese uh, crackle glazes. So they're firing this sink and those toilets three times in a kiln to emulate what was going on one time in a kiln. They call that progress. Or at least a capitalist progress. So how do I work? How am I going to then, once you come to these realizations, how do you possibly go and buy chemicals and materials that have been extracted from mines, plugging trout streams in Montana, the talc mines, ruining other people's environments, so I can make something. So in Collegeville Township, right next to St. John's, because of the glaciers going all the way down, pushing all the beautiful soil and mountains, there was at where I live, there used to be 4,800 foot mountains that got ground all the way down to Kansas in the ice ages. 
and they stop in central Minnesota right here. And so this is a road cut bed where they're cutting into the road. And, and I saw this, we saw this beautiful clay deposit. So I went to Father Michael Blecker, the president of the university, and I said, Father Michael, I found a clay deposit they're going to destroy because in, I'm a township supervisor, Avon Township. And one of the things is, is you're always looking for gravel for road construction. And you need a clay deposit to put in with the gravel so you can have class two and class five gravel. So our finest clay deposits in Minnesota get contaminated and corrupted into road building materials. They do that everywhere in America. Beautiful porcelain deposits, stoneware deposits, just as long as it's plastic enough so that they can use it for road construction. That's our engineers who don't understand the value of the material or the materiality of that. So I went to Father Michael and said, in order to save this deposit, I'd like to bring enough clay to St. John's for 300 years of pottery making. He says, well, Richard, um, in 1500 years of Benedictine history, it's not all that long. I trust what you're doing. For the faculty out here who have got tenure, if you went into the dean's office or the president said, I want to dig enough clay to bring over to Illinois University's grounds to make pottery for the pottery students for 300 years, they say, how long is tenure going to last anyway? The other aspects, so we brought 18,000 tons of this clay to St. John's. And that's what we've been using since 1979 for visiting artist programs for my work that you're seeing here, all out of natural materials. And then I went out back out to North Dakota to visit my relatives. And I said, can I burn a Navy bean straw stack? Because they were uh, getting, uh, were farming Navy beans at this time. And um, there's only one relative who said, are you kidding? You're gonna wanna burn a, a full stack of straw and, and for what? And then, so um, here we're burning the straw. And this is what the glazes look like. This is navy bean straw ash glaze. So there we use four, four different kinds of straw ash glazes. This is a flax straw ash glaze from my uncle Leo's farm out in uh, central North Dakota. So we're burning the straw and we've got a wonderful young couple down in southwestern Minnesota that are doing organic soybeans. They bring in the round, big round bales and we're able to get this wonderful um, straw ash glazes for the, for the uh, pottery. And some of them are uh, on display here. So then um, because we had to build a student union because you can't get any students to come to a university unless you got a really ritzy student union. Every, every university has got to have a really nice student union. If it's a really old kind of butt ugly student union, then no students want to come here because their parents are, so I'm staying over in the Hyatt and there's all these mothers and fathers with their kids coming to check out the, the, um, the, the university. So, this is where the student union was going, but the, one of the oldest buildings on the campus, their carriage house, which had underground vaults for storing food. So this was built before, before electricity got to Minnesota. This is 1890s building. All handmade wood-fired brick by the monastery. They made 15,000 brick a day at the monastery with a, a glacial trail material. So the president at that time in 1990 says, we're not tearing down our history anymore. We're, scrape off was not a vocabulary. And so we're gonna move this building. So they used 18747 wheel assemblies and lifted up the building and moved it to another part of campus. They did about 34 to 60 feet a day. It took them three months to move the building. And then that's where we designed. And, and Dietrich said to me before he, when he became president, he says, build what's important for 21st century learning. So that's what the design of the studio was underneath Joe Hall in 1990. So this is the Johanna Kiln that John showed you a very wonderful um, image of. It's, a, it's a 87 feet long. And um, now I'd like you, uh, most of you in the audience got little packets, little white packets. And I wanna apologize to the housekeeping people because if you spill these, they're gonna be all over the place. So I want you to open your packets up that I gave you, little white envelopes. Put that material into your hand. Okay. Okay. 
Thank you very much for doing this. No, thank you, thank you. Okay, this material that they're putting in, that you have them putting into your hand is the hulls of the wild rice, wild rice hulls. For the Native American community, this is as sacred as communion is for Christian culture. So wild rice, and from where I live going north up into Red Lake, there were 60 different nations that would come to this region to harvest the wild rice in the fall. So the map of each uh, nation, their responsibility, there's a beautiful map that um, Winona LaDuke has in White Earth that shows all the different tribes coming to that part of Minnesota to harvest the wild rice. Okay, so this is the shell of the wild rice. So just think of it as like a little spaceship. You know, like think of Star Wars or Star Trek or all the stuff that you guys grew up with. This is a little spaceship because this shell takes the finest silicas, water-based molecular silica out of the water with minuscule amounts of calcium to protect that next generation seed. That seed can lie dormant at the bottom of a lake bed for seven generations and not have any degrade. So that if we have a flood in Minnesota and the lake is too high, that shell, that little seed shell spaceship doesn't pop off and allow that seed to drown, unable to get up for photosynthesis. If it's a drought and the lake bed is too shallow, it will not pop off and allow it to not get enough water for germination. So it knows the optimum condition for the optimum environment. It can think seven generations ahead. This material does not melt till 2,380 degrees Fahrenheit. It's a natural refractory. So all of you maybe who is experimenting with cements, looking at natural refractories, high temperature silicate systems, this natural material you can put into stucco, you can put into all different kinds of, it doesn't compost. They just have to push it into the, into the wetlands when at the seed haulers, because it takes 500 degrees of temperature to take that little seed off. They have to fire this called parching. So the Native Americans would have these big parching uh, iron kettles that they would fire and then the seeds would pop off, the shell pops off. That's how much energy it takes to pop that shell off for, for, so that they can eat that food. So you can see then there's all sorts of wild rice hulls one piece on top of the other piece, on top of the other piece, on top of the other piece. So in that Tanagashima chamber, I can put three times, I can put 7,000 pieces of sculpture and ceramics into that chamber that is not touching wild, that is not touching each other. It's the wild rice hull. So this type of jar right here was fired on its side, with lid on, on top of another piece, on top of another piece to 2,200 degrees Fahrenheit a sterile surface, okay? So this is the lighting ceremony. The abbot comes down and blesses the kiln. This is the last lighting ceremony that Sister Johanna came down. They got her, we got her out of the um, nursing home in, in a little cart and she lit the fire. And so this kiln was named after my art history teacher. So for those young people who are gonna have children, you want to name your children after your best professors, okay? That's what you want to do. So here's Johanna. She's lighting the, the two fireboxes with all these people. We get about 400 people who come to the lighting ceremony. And then we fire for 10 days in teams of people for 24 hours a day. So about 45 people come to uh, be part of the firing. There are nine cooks. Um, so we feed anybody who comes in the door. So we may have anywhere from 200 to 300 people for dinner every night or 50 to 60. So my friend, Jim Clark, it's almost like a brother to me. He comes all the way from Chicago and he makes cassoule for about 80 people during the firing. And so this community of people is what makes all of this beautiful. I cannot do this. If I don't have these people, I do not work because I can't make 
I can't stay up and stoke a firing for 10 days by myself. So what, as an architect, will you do when you're doing the, the, your, your, your part of your process that it's singular, but who do you need to make it a reality in that sense? So this is stoking the Tanagashima chamber and then sealing the clay after the firing is done. And then, so that's a, takes two and a half months to load the kiln because it takes about 10,000 pieces to load the firing. We load for two and a half months. We fire for 10 days, two weeks of cooling, a week and a half of unloading and nine months of cleaning. It doesn't fit into an academic world at all because if you come into a pottery studio and we do something together and fire, your parents are waiting for a grade. So how are you gonna get a grade when you have to wait two and a half years for something, okay? But this is these people. This is some of the people that help with the firing. And this is in um, the memory of Mitsuo Kakutani, the uh, great ceramic professor at, um, at the uh, University uh, in Earlham College in Indiana. Okay, so these are some of the people that come from all over the world to help with the firing. This is the family, okay? And this is what they do. So all of those colors you see on that surface, that is made by the fire. That is not made by the artist. All that slip painting, all that movement, that's the artist making. So it's one third the artist being able to speak, one third the materials being able to speak, and one third the kiln being able to speak. And if you think you wanna be more than 30% of the project, it's time to get a different career because your expectations of what you really want in life are an illusion. So if you know that you need all of this community to make this beautiful and that you're only one third of this process, then you can start thinking more towards why we are using the materials we are using and wasting them. So the other part of the process for the studio is collaboration. So all of you know what this form is. We often call this a teapot form, but actually it's not. When you go to the museum, you look it up, it's called a ewer, E-W-E-R. E and it was Chinese, one of them is Chinese, one's Korean. So that's where our teapot came from form. So like you always get misnomers when you don't go, when you don't really research the culture that you're in, you're just buying it as a commodity to sell someplace else. You totally don't understand why you made it or why you're selling it for that matter. So we've got these forms. This is only used for ceremonial wine pouring at religious and court ceremonies. So then my dear friend, Paul Kruger, who had lost his leg in Vietnam. And, when his, and, and for those people who lived in the 1960s, you remember the macrame kits that you could buy, you could do all these nodding forms and hang a mirror from them. I see some people still nodding in the audience. Okay, good. Um, when he was in Vietnam, when he was in Vietnam, he lost his leg. He's in Philadelphia in a multiple limb loss hospital. His mom sends him, sends him the macrame kit. He realizes the nodding form is the bridge between abstract algebra and three-dimensional geometry. So these teapot handles made out of rattan, hand dyed, hand lacquered, are a part of an architectural program of like, if you're gonna drink good green tea, you don't want the handle to break because you never would hold on to a handle. And that's the first, engineering wise, that's the first, the weakest part of ceramics. So if you have a non-breakable form, then you're gonna have a longer type of form for use everyday use because a teapot develops a patina and the quality of flavor on the inside of the teapot. There's an old adage in Taiwan that if a fire starts in the house, you get the family out. And if you can still get back in the house, you go for the teapot because it's part of the family. Okay. So this is designed so that the lugs lift up the teapot so it cools off so that you're not turning your tea bitter. Okay. And then sculptural cake plate. So uh, today at Japan House, we have a lovely tea ceremony with a teibachi. So this is the contemporary view of a teibachi for me, having, having two artists working on that form as a cake plate. They're much larger for more community use. So I would like to just talk about artists that are makers. And now you are in an environment where you got all of these beautiful labs. I toured 
three or four different labs of making for the architecture department. And in the 21st century for making, this is 20th century things. This is Koi Dioji, the great artist. He started out and survived the atomic bombing in Japan. But what he started was making sculpture of work and melting the clocks and the women's sewing machine at the temperature the nuclear, nuclear weapon was at in that particular area. So it was a testament. These are testimonials to those individuals. And he's been, and he, since uh, the last firing was in mem his memory, he died on August 7th on the 75th anniversary of the atomic bombing of Hiroshima. So he would come to the studio and make really incredible work. So that's what we also do is not only collaboration in creating, but also visiting artists. For those people who are doing all that beautiful work out on those walls that we just came in, using all different kinds of paper and recycling and doing the dumpster diving, just think of a Joseph Albers during the Bauhaus made all of his students go to the dumpsters. Now you got John Clark telling you to go jump in the dumpsters and get your stuff out of there. Very good. So this is a Japanese artist who's taking the junk cardboard boxes and making this beautiful Amida Buddha, the Buddha of healing. So this is the side view. And you can see all the different kind of Japanese and the advertising and everything. And then when you turn it, it becomes a space of the soul. So here are the two views of this. Beautiful, beautiful construction with natural materials out of the dumpster, cardboard. This is by Kondo-san. This is a ode to all the people who died in Fukushima from radiation poisoning. Kondo-san's family made the beautiful blue and white porcelains. So what he did was he took the waste cobalt that's being thrown away from the brushes and everything that's in the, in the bottom of things. And he used the waste cobalt to paint his own, um, the, the surface, he cast his own body in porcelain. And then he used silver nitrate and fired the silver nitrate to make the sweat of people dying of radiation poisoning on the surface. So this is your 21st century artists that are trying to somehow communicate to you the nature of these deep tragedies that are affecting us and the climate change. So this is a series of work I also do on the prophetic messenger. And that's about the book that was done. And this prophetic messenger is we always assassinate our prophetic. We have the very famous people we know that are assassinated. Aviushka Poland, Benigno Aquino, the Philippines, Martin Luther King, all these people that we assassinate because they bring some sort of different process that embraces all humanity. And we don't like that. So we just go and kill them. So how do we have the ability to allow the prophetic to pass through? So um, I was commissioned by the president of the university to make the first sculpture in the uh, John Hassler, the great writers uh, sculpture garden on our campus. And so they said, okay, make a sculpture for the sculpture garden. And so the architect drew up all these really fanciful pieces of ceramics that were about eight feet tall that I was supposed to make. And I, because this person really doesn't understand the freeze thaw cycle of 40 below zero weather and then heating up to about 20 degrees above and then going down to 20 below zero, that ceramics doesn't do well outside in those types of climates. So, I changed the whole aspect because what am I going to make that for the students, for the young people in the 21st century, I'm walking around in your century. And if, it's an, if we don't create everything we do to deal with climate change and what's happening to the planet, all of this is for nothing. So I decided that I would make all these beautiful little ceramic containers that would hold the endangered species of the three sisters, corn, beans, squash, and pumpkin. And these would have handwritten on Japanese paper that would go inside that jar. This is the 1500 year old cave bean seeds found in the Southwestern United States, all of that genetics. This is then 
dedicated to Marcel Breuer. So inside this sculpture, a sacred kura is 182 endangered species of seeds. And there is stories of 176 artists that are my heroes, the people I have great admiration for. There's a couple of them that are sitting in the audience. And then we pack, I pack those seeds amongst wild rice hulls. These are a series of carvings and fired wood firing, but coats of organic canola oil because uh, Winona LaDuke from White Earth was at an excavation site in Milwaukee with the Manitoba Native Americans where they found a small ball in the excavation site. They broke the ball open. It had uh, squash seeds in it that were carbon dated 800 years old and they grew, they grew. So that's a, a, a Gekkinus somenike squash that we grow in our garden. And that's what's the seeds that are inside those containers. And then they're sealed with beeswax and then with museum wax, packed in with wild rice hulls, sealed again, so that they can then be put inside the sculpture. And so this is the Marcel Breuer uh, library and an addition on. So this is a board form concrete and we're lifting over so that slab was cut out of the Breuer Library and was gonna be thrown away and said, save the slab, save the granite. Six inches by 11 and a half by uh, six and a half feet. That was the base for the sculpture. <clears throat> the stones that they're uh, putting down right here are the steps of the Abbey Church that were quarried in 1895, taken to the monastery in 1897 for their steps to their church. Prior to that, the state of Minnesota bought that quarry and they built the prison with it. So all that black granite was for the prison. So these stones right here were quarried by prisoners and never got paid. So now they hold the sculpture up. So here, the, uh, here comes the sculpture, stainless steel, and this is the uh, pink quartzite from Southern Minnesota. It's the only stone known to mankind. You can fire it at 2,400 degrees Fahrenheit and it self glazes itself. It's pink quartzite. So that's already built into the stainless steel and then we're gonna be putting a 300 year roof on there. And then this is the spirit stone right here. This shelters the area where the spirit, you ask when mother earth, if you can for this very short time period, use this space. And then this is um, putting on the um, uh, wild rice hulls and stucco onto the mesh for the preservation. And then we use cables from the um, bridge building cables that are powder coated in gold and then they're gold leafed. So that radiant light comes down from the, st uh, the, the stones. So this is where we're loading in, loading in day, um, loading in all of the, um, so in each one of those containers is the nutrition of 14 different seed varieties of corn, bean, squash, and pumpkin that a whole community can use. So there's 16 that we can go out and you can give each one a pod and you can grow enough food for thousands of people. And then, so this is what the sculpture looks like. I don't call it a sculpture. I call it a, a temporary kura seed storage because right now the Russians are emptying out all of Ukraine's seeds to force starvation. We have this delusion. You're surrounded by cornfields all around Illinois, around this community, and you're not gonna have any starvation. You have your heads examined. It's gonna be here at some point in time. So we're not going to Norway to get seeds out of, of that ice place up in Norway. We're gonna to have to do it for our own communities. And so seed savers are really important because the trail, a trail of tears, Cherokee beans are in here. And the, and the native Cherokee people that, were, that did that genocide walk from Atlanta area all the way to Oklahoma, they just released their glass gem corn seeds to the, to the public because they felt that genetics was important, that they've hid away from Monsanto and Bear. Okay. So this, you can take the roof off. There'll be, you take the ceramic lid off, you take the stainless steel lid off, you can reach down, grab the tool, you can take the roof off. And then inside that is a tube also of the scroll of the, of the rule of St. Benedict based on women so that the two spiritual communities are now one together. So you'll realize most of our teachers are um, not in the university. 
usually outside the university. So one day I had a young man come and visit the studio right around Christmas time. And he said, my mom and dad just sent me two cups uh, for Christmas. And can I talk to you? And I said, sure, you can talk to me. Bill tall guy, beautiful long hair, that type of thing. And he says, can I see your, your kiln? I said, so I take him down and show him the kiln. He says, can I see all your data on your firing charts? I said, sure. So I go get the firing charts. So we're sitting around the Edority and he says, you're doing the exact same thing I'm doing. And I thought, oh, you're a potter from Austin, Texas. He said, no, 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 no. I'm an astrophysicist. And my PhD research is in the Orion Nebulas. So if there's anything that you, you know, the James Webb has kind of captured all of the new uh, telescope kinds of things, but he's built in Argentina down in Patagonia and th in those areas on those high desert flats, building all these radio telescopes, uh, the uh, uh, infrared telescopes. And that's how this wonderful woman found the first black hole with some all those telescopes used together from all different parts of the world to find and see the black hole for the first time. So when I'm visiting with somebody like that, you know, like, because as we get older, these gray cells really stiffen up. And so you say, okay, all right, you're an astrophysicist. It's just going right over my head. I'm going, okay. He says, no, I'm not kidding. I'll send you slides from NASA. And I'm now in charge of the SOFIA project. So if there's anything you remember, look up the SOFIA project. It's a 747 with a garage door that goes up at 42,000 feet at nighttime out of Ed Air Force Base in, in, um, in California. And they have a broadband telescope different than Hubble and Spitzer. And Luke Ke Keller is his name. He's the astrophysicist, um, excuse me. And um, he will send me photographs and he sends them information. They just first saw the surface of Jupiter through the Jupiter clouds. For the first time in humanity, we see the surface of Jupiter. So he says, what you're doing in your kiln is no different than what's going on out in the universe. It takes 1500 light years of space to do what's going on inside your kiln. I said, okay. So then he sends me the mathematics. 10 to the power of 19 and a half and three quarter is the temperature of the kiln and the pressure of firing on earth. We're all held by this molecular power of gravity. For us to be here is 10 to the power of 19. So what's going on here, he says, what you're making is new star formations. So when I look in the kiln at 2,300 degrees Fahrenheit, I realize that that whole flow of hydrogen oxygen clouds is no different than what's going on in outer space. It's just dense so that we can see it. It's a denser environment. So this is fired upside down on coral and seashells because you get a normal calcium coral. And so like um, the salt ions and the calcium ions create a natural blaze on that interior, like a beautiful black hole and then radiant event horizon that's, um, that, that Stephen Hawking talks about at the edge of a black hole. But I'd like to finish today. Um, and this is um, for you to as artists, um, just think of yourself in the 21st century and someone in the 32nd century comes and they see your work. So in Kyoto, Japan, there's the Saihoji Temple. It's called the Moss Temple Garden. And it was built in the 12th century, beginning of the 13th century by Muso Soseki. And Muso Soseki built these beautiful gardens and he anticipated that there'd be over 370 different varieties of moss that would grow in this garden. So that's why they call it the Moss Temple Garden. So when you make an appointment to go to that garden, you go in with a group. Before you can go into the garden, you have to copy sutras, prayers that go inside the pagoda. I pray for that I can enter paradise. I pray that I can then be in the earth's most beautiful space. So I get, we get in there and it's absolute silence except for one little bamboo tube you can hear in the distance. I'm standing there looking at these stones in the middle of this pond and I have no idea, but the abbot of the Taihoji walks up next to me and he says, do you know why those stones are there? And I said, I have no idea why those stones are there. I just can't keep my eyes off them right now. He says, well, this was Muso Soseki trying to send messages to us 
that these are the seven healing spices that were brought over by boat to Japan to heal in the food system. Sancho, Tosho, Ocha, Matcha. So as I'm walking through the garden, I come onto this. And it's the outline of a sunken boat. And, I, and I'm from Minnesota, and so if you don't take your boat out in the middle of the, you know, in the fall before the ice comes in, and you let your boat sink there, you're not a very good steward of your boat and the cabin and all this kind of stuff. So there's a whole series of protocols you got to do to get to the cabin and open up in the springtime and close it in the, in the wintertime. So I'm standing and I'm, and I'm wondering why would you want to have a sunken boat? If you are in paradise, you no longer have to wander. You can let your boat be at rest. Thank you. <laughs>